What does the name London mean to you? Capital of England, cradle of history. London policeman, a holiday. The place where you work or live, your school days. Sad times, happy memories. Well, London is all this and more. Like any city, it has a million secrets and it's all interesting to discover one. For instance, did you know that St. John's Wood in London is the home of the King's Troop of the Royal Horse Artillery? one time there are about 120 horses on the strength of the troop. Most of the horses are of Irish stock, short-backed, smallish horses able to turn on a sixpence, perfect qualities for inclusion in a gun team. However, it's not much use having good horses without competent horsemen to control and ride them. Young soldiers and recruits are introduced to the intricacies of horsemanship under the benevolent eye of an instructor. The period of training varies, but on average it will take a soldier six weeks before he's good enough to go out on an exercise parade. And it takes near enough 18 months of training before a soldier will be allowed to ride as a member of a gun team on a major saluting parade. The training of a lead driver, the most important man in the team, will take three years. Horses are like people. They love to be pampered. Haircut, sir? Of course, sir. Short back and size. I see you're in the army. Terrible how dirty your feet get, brother, sir. I believe you wanted a ponytail, madam. Yes, hairy legs are so unsightly. A little higher. That's it. Oh, lovely. Here. Yeah. Careful with me ears. Joking aside, it's easy to see why it is when the King's Troop go on parade that the horses look so magnificent and are always the subject for flattering comment. Although the horses have water in their stalls, to get them accustomed to field conditions, they're in to drink from troughs. Some of them, like children, love to play with water. Many of the older crafts and traditions live on within the King's Troop barracks at St. John's Wood like that of the master saddler. The craft trade of saddler has very high standards. These are just a few of the items from the army saddler's class one trade test. Must be able to make all types of saddles, harness and instrument cases with skill and precision. Must have a thorough practical knowledge of saddle and harness fitting, particularly as applied to animals with high withers and other peculiarities must be able to take charge of a small saddler's shop or a group of saddlers in a large shop. My reaction to that little lot? Well, I'm impressed. Alongside the saddler's shop is the harness room. The army term for polishing the steel parts of the harness is rifting. All steel work must be burnished before the polishing of the leather can commence. The safety of mount and man depends on the good condition of the harness and the suppleness of the leather is essential for the horse's comfort. Constant handling of the steel whilst burnishing ensures that any fault is noticed immediately. The guns used by the troop are 13 pounders. This is the weight of the shell that the gun fires. There are six guns and limbers in the troop, all of which go out on ceremonial parades. As the King's Troop is constantly in the public's eye, the guns must always be impeccably turned out. 
The bright work on the guns is not chromium plated, it's stainless steel. And the effect is achieved by polished good old elbow grease. As much care is taken to ensure that the inside of the gun sparkles just as much as the exterior. The tailor's shop belies the old army saying that they have two sizes, too big and too small. These tailors ensure that when a gunner goes on parade, he looks right. Incidentally, in case you're confused, soldiers of the King's Troop are not known as troopers. Their title is gunner, because, remember, they are members of the Royal Horse Artillery. When a man was posted to the Royal Horse Artillery, it was sometimes known as getting his jacket, because of the special shape of the jacket. Old soldiers will tell you that every part of the uniform had a secondary use. The plume could always be used as a shaving brush, whilst the ring on the plume was a fine emergency wedding ring. The small ornament at the base of the plume could be used to pick out stones from the horse's hooves. The small busby, which probably originated from the Hungarian hussar headdress, was a handy carrier of water or fodder for the horses. The red pouch on the side of the busby, old gunners will tell you, carried either letters or orders and when going into battle would be filled with wet sand to ward off sword attacks. The line cords made fine emergency reins. And even the buttons could be used as ammunition as they fitted exactly into the muskets that the troop used to carry. Finally, the red stripe on the trousers could be taken off for use as bandages should the need arise. These stories have been handed down over the years and nobody now knows where facts end and legend begin. Another of the craft trades in the King's Troop is that of carrier or blacksmith. In a setting usually associated with an old English village and times gone by, these men, vital to the welfare of the troop's horses, attend to each of the 120 horses on the strength of the troop once every three weeks. It might look painful, but don't worry about it. It doesn't hurt the horses one bit. You see, a horse's hooves are like our finger and toenails. They are insensitive. By the way, I bet you didn't know that horses, like people, walk differently, and that farriers can correct any faults in a horse's walk or trot by fitting a half shoe, a three-quarter shoe, and even built-up shoes, which can prevent a horse kicking itself while it's moving. It's a little like going to the chiropodist, on a bigger scale, of course. Can't you just hear the blacksmith saying, when I've finished with you, you'll be skipping about like a two-year-old. Notice that the nails do not get driven fully into the hoof. The nail ends come out of the side and are then twisted off. Hard to believe, but the horse just doesn't feel a thing. In fact, they'd be a lot more uncomfortable without shoes. In days gone by, famous cavalry regiments, such as the Greys, the 17th 21st Lancers and the 14th Hussars were great exponents in the use of the lance. This exercise, known as tent pegging, requires a great deal of skill if the rider is to be accurate. Regiments stationed in India, remember the Bengal Lancers, used the lance in wild boar hunts or pig sticking as it was then known. Another weapon, the sword, required a great deal of agility on the rider if it was to be effective. In addition, it needed the rider to have a strong wrist and arm. But all that was long ago. Today, the weapons are only used in inter-unit competitions on blocks of wood. The outdoor riding school, looking like a mini show jumping course, is being used today to train lead drivers in the intricacies of jumping a pair of horses. It doesn't look too easy, and indeed, it isn't. Holding the reins of two horses and a whip 
whilst negotiating hurdles, is quite a feat, demanding courage and ability from rider and horses. But it's not all work, sweat and polish. In the evenings, social life takes over. It looks much any pub or club, except that men in uniform just off duty give the location away. Every mess will, of course, proudly display trophies, such as this model field gun and limber, a perfect replica of the Wellington gun used by the Royal Horse Artillery at the Battle of Waterloo in 1850. Regimental silver is always displayed, and those lucky enough to be invited to the mess are impressed by its background history. No mess could be complete without paintings of great occasions in the life of the troop. This one depicts the parade at Buckingham Palace in 1960. The occasion, the presentation of a brooch to Her Majesty by the King's troop. Conversations in the mess are pretty standard. Darts, football, the quality of the beer, postings, regiments, overseas news and so on. Could be though that the positioning of a lance in the vicinity of the dartboard is a subtle warning to visitors. Play us at your peril, we're good. Preparations for a salute, or indeed any ceremonial parade, start early. And on the day itself, it is the horses that are the main focus of attention. Every available man turns in to groom those horses on parade. By 900 hours, manes and tails will have been washed, coats will shine like satin after brushing and curry combing. It only remains for harness, saddles and head collars to be fitted. When the trumpeter sounds boots and saddles, which is blown 30 minutes before file out, the tempo starts to speed up. Getting into a full dress uniform is a process not to be rushed. The officer's horses, known officially as chargers, sense that today is a special one. A nice touch is that horses not going on the parade are still made a fuss of, as a horse hates to feel left out. The care and attention lavished on equipment and animal is a credit to all concerned. Everything literally sparkles and gleams. The fitting of saddle cloths and bridles are near enough to being the final touches. The next bugle call is blown 15 minutes before file out. This is when the butterflies start in the stomachs of those soldiers preparing for their first parade. Everyone is fully aware of their responsibilities to look smartly turned out. And often it's a two-man job to get the lines in the correct position. The funny thing is that the nearer one gets to the actual parade, the steadier the nerves become. I suppose it's because the last-minute touches and attention to detail don't give one time to feel tension. That five-minute call. Not much time now to adjust anything. But really, there's nothing to alter. Tradition and time-honored practices have seen to it that all is in the right place. The timing is just right. File out sounds. Now there is a job to do, and both the men and the horses know exactly what is expected of them. From a high angle overlooking the parade ground, it looks a little like a boy's collection of toy soldiers. No doubt this effect is heightened because of the calm, unhurried, unflappable manner in which the parade forms up. The six gun teams are quickly hooked up, traces are adjusted, riders swing into the saddle, while grooms with pride give gleaming harness, leather and glossy coats a final polish prior to inspection. That white glove, used as a duster, won't show a single mark. I wonder, ladies, if your housework could pass a similar test. I'm sure it would.
Each subsection is inspected prior to moving off. The subsections line up with A subsection at the top of the parade ground and F subsection at the lower end of the square. While the inspection continues, it's an ideal opportunity of telling you a little of the history of the King's Troop. Records tell us that the first military use to be made of St. John's Wood Farm, as it was then, was in November 1804. Its purpose? Quartering and stabling a detachment of the Corps of Gunner Drivers and their horses at a rental of £150 a year. Since then, there have been guns at the wood almost continuously, apart from gaps during the two world wars. The old barracks were demolished in 1969, and the present barracks were reoccupied by the troop in April 1972. To a background of paintings of the troop, let me continue with a little more history. In December of 1945, King George VI advised the War Office that he, the King, would like the pre-war practice of royal salutes to be resumed commencing on his next birthday. The saluting battery stationed at St. John's Wood should revert to its pre-war status as a Royal Horse Artillery battery with the appropriate uniform. After six years of war, this was no easy task. There were practically no army horses. The 13-pounder guns, limbers and harnesses were scattered to the four winds, and the men with the know-how of Royal salutes with horses and riders were few and far between. However, in that wonderful way the British Army has of coming up trumps, the riding troop, as it was known, after many trials and tribulations, was ready for its first salute on the King's official birthday on June the 13th, 1946. Those who may have felt some trepidation because of the date were proved to be wrong, as the salute went off without a hitch. When King George visited the barracks some little while later and was enjoying a sherry, surrounded by the CO, master gunner, visiting senior officers, and the like, His Majesty casually mentioned, I believe you would like to be called the King's Battery. Bill Norman, the then CO, asked, Sir, could it be the King's Troop? And the King good-humouredly said, All right, so long as it's mine, I don't mind what you call it. When Queen Elizabeth II became monarch, a letter was forwarded to the effect that it was her wish that the title should remain unaltered as the King's Troop throughout her reign, in view of the special interest taken in the troop by her late father. As the men, horses and guns move along the streets of London on their way to Hyde Park, they are a magnificent sight. Troop fires at least six salutes each year, in addition to appearing at about a dozen state and ceremonial occasions. The Royal Tournament, tattoos, horse and agricultural shows, festivals of military music, involving a march past display or musical drive, are just some of the calls for the troop to appear throughout the length and breadth of the country. Requests for the King's troop to appear overseas are numerous, but many of these have reluctantly to be refused. They have, in fact, been airlifted to Denmark, Italy, France, Canada, complete. Men, horses, guns, uniforms, harness, limbers, which entails a full-scale exercise in planning. The advance party, already in position at the saluting area, know that the troop will shortly enter the park and gallop into position. It's time now for the gunners to take up their places alongside the ammunition boxes. This is Marble Arch in the heart of London, once the site of Tyburn Gate, where public executions were carried out. The privilege of passing through the gates of Marble Arch is only extended to the reigning monarch and the king's troop. Looking at the traffic moving on its way, nose to tail, around the outskirts of Hyde Park, I feel that the horse and carriage must have looked better in this setting. However, so-called progress has decreed they have gone forever. Entering Hyde Park with the famed Speaker's Corner on the left, the troop will wheel into line. The signal will be given to increase pace from a walk to a trot and then to a full gallop. Could you ever see a more stirring sight? Horses, men and guns surge into motion for that glorious, exhilarating dash of intoxicating speed. All too quickly, the troop is up on the gun positions. The number four of the team is already waiting. The lead drivers bring their horses to a halt some 40 feet past them.
The officers, number ones, and the detachments fling themselves from their horses. Guns are unlimbered and manhandled into perfect alignment. Horse holders, teams, and limbers retreat to the area known as the wagon line. Silence and immobility as the seconds stick by and the CO waits for noon. Then the order. Number one gun, fire! The staccato bark of the gun crashes out and the pressure waves resound around the park. In sequence, the guns continue to fire until the salute is completed. Cease firing. Limber up. On the gun positions, each number one slams the handspike home on the trail of his gun. The detachments kneel like statues as the teams thunder up to and past them, wheel and turn. Everything moves like a well-oiled machine, slotting into place like an intricate jigsaw. The guns move back, limber up, a dash for the horses and into the saddles. All except the number fours who will remain on the gun positions until march off. The troop moves away, an undulating sea of bay, brown and black horses. The King's Troop, Royal Horse Artillery, are proud of their tradition. And all those privileged to see them know that they have seen a body of men who take pride of place on ceremonial parades, and whose standards are second to none.